There's a nation that shouldn't exist. Not politically, engineering-wise. Less than half the size of West Virginia, surrounded by desert, with rainfall so rare that most of its land gets less water than Death Valley. Yet today, this country doesn't just survive, it exports water. It has more fresh water per capita than Germany. Its farmers grow crops in sand. Its cities never ration. While Cape Town nearly ran dry and California battles mega droughts, this place has a surplus. And it wasn't always like this. 50 years ago, engineers stood in the Negev Desert with a terrifying question. How do you keep millions of people alive in a place that gets 10 inches of rain a year? The answer they built is now being copied across the world. This is the story of how Israel turned the desert into a water superpower. But it's not just about innovation. It's about what happens when failure isn't an option, when every drop of water is a matter of survival, and when you have to engineer your way out of geography itself. Because what Israel built wasn't just infrastructure. It was a system so advanced that it defies the natural limits of where humans can live. And the consequences of that success and the vulnerabilities hiding inside it are reshaping how the world thinks about water, scarcity, and the future. If you enjoy massive engineering projects and future technology, subscribe to Next Blueprint USA, like the video, and comment where you think this is heading. The problem starts with the map. Israel sits in one of the driest regions on Earth. 60% of its land is desert. Its primary freshwater source, the Sea of Galilee, is a lake barely the size of a large reservoir. Rainfall is unpredictable, seasonal, and concentrated in the north. The south gets almost nothing. For most of human history, this would have been a hard limit. A cap on how many people could live there, how much agriculture could grow, how far cities could expand. But Israel didn't accept that limit. Starting in the 1960s, engineers began building what would become one of the most sophisticated water systems on the planet. It began with a simple, audacious idea. Move water from where it falls to where people need it. The first mega project was the National Water Carrier, completed in 1964. It's a 130-kilometer pipeline system that pumps water from the Sea of Galilee in the north down to the bone-dry Negev Desert in the south. At the time, it was considered almost reckless draining a freshwater lake to irrigate desert farmland. Critics argued it was unsustainable, that it would deplete the lake within decades. And for a while, they were right. By the early 2000s, the Sea of Galilee had dropped to dangerous levels. The carrier system alone couldn't solve the problem. It is a Sisa. Israel needed a new source, one that didn't depend on rain. That's when the real engineering began. Desalination had been tried before, but it was expensive, energy-intensive, and inefficient. Most countries used it only for emergency backup. Israel decided to bet the entire water supply on it. In 2005, the first large-scale desalination plant opened in Ashkelon. It was massive, capable of producing 100 million cubic meters of fresh water per year by pulling salt out of Mediterranean seawater. Nap. Then came Hadera, Sorek, and others. Today, Israel has five major desalination plants running along its coast. Together, they produce nearly 600 million cubic meters of water annually, enough to supply 80% of the country's drinking water. But building the plants was only half the challenge. The real problem was making desalination cheap enough to use everywhere. Engineers had to rethink the entire process. Traditional desalination uses thermal distillation, boiling seawater and collecting the steam. It works, but it burns through energy. Israel pioneered reverse osmosis at industrial scale. Instead of boiling, they force seawater through ultra-fine membranes at high pressure. The salt stays behind. Clean water passes through. It sounds simple, but the membranes clog, pumps break down, and the pressure required is immense. Israel's plants run 24-7, processing millions of gallons per hour. A single failure could cut water to entire cities, so engineers built redundancy into everything. Backup membranes, multiple pump systems, fail-safes stacked on fail-safes. It worked. Desalination costs in Israel dropped by more than 50% over a decade. What was once an expensive backup became the primary source. Do you hit like? But even with desalination solving the supply problem, there was still waste. Every city loses water to leaks, to sewage, to runoff. In most countries, 30 to 40% of urban water is lost before it's ever used. Israel couldn't afford that, so they built a second system, National Wastewater Recycling. 
Not just treating sewage and dumping it into rivers, actually reclaiming it, purifying it, and pumping it back into the agricultural grid. Today, Israel recycles nearly 90% of its wastewater. That's the highest rate on Earth. Spain, in second place, recycles less than 20%. The United States recycles around 8%. The backbone of this system is a network of treatment plants spread across the country. Sewage flows in, gets filtered, biologically treated, and disinfected until it meets strict agricultural standards. Then it's pumped into the Negev through a separate pipeline system, meaning recycled water never mixes with drinking supplies. Farmers use it to grow tomatoes, peppers, dates, citrus, crops that would be impossible in the desert otherwise. Some critics called it risky. There were concerns about contaminants, about long-term soil health, about whether recycled wastewater could sustain industrial-scale farming. But Israel didn't have the luxury of waiting for perfect data. They monitored soil chemistry, adjusted treatment protocols, and kept refining. Two decades later, the system works. Recycled water now provides nearly half of Israel's agricultural supply. Yet even this wasn't enough. Desalination and recycling solved supply and reuse, but there was still the problem of efficiency. Every drop of water pumped into a field, every liter sent through a city pipe. How do you make sure none of it is wasted? That's where Israel made its next breakthrough, precision irrigation. In the 1960s, an engineer named Simcha Blass invented drip irrigation. Instead of flooding fields or using overhead sprinklers, drip systems deliver water directly to plant roots through a network of tubes and emitters. It's slow, targeted, and incredibly efficient. Early versions reduced water use by 30 to 50% compared to traditional methods, but they were expensive and, and difficult to maintain. Emitters clogged. Pressure had to be perfectly balanced. Farmers were skeptical. Israel subsidized the technology, taught farmers how to use it, and kept improving the design. Within two decades, drip irrigation became the standard. Today, nearly 75% of Israel's farmland uses drip or micro-sprinkler systems. Sensors monitor soil moisture in real time. Computer systems adjust water flow based on weather forecasts, crop type, even individual plant needs. Some farms use AI-driven irrigation controllers that learn optimal watering patterns over time. The result? Israeli farmers grow more food per liter of water than almost anywhere else on Earth. A tomato farm in the Negev uses a fraction of the water that a similar farm in California would need, and because much of that water is recycled wastewater, the system operates in a near-closed loop. Subscribe for more deep dives into future technology. But here's the part most people miss. Israel's water system isn't just about infrastructure, it's about control. The entire grid, desalination plants, pipelines, treatment facilities, irrigation networks, is managed by a national water authority called Mekarat. It's a government-owned company that operates like a utility monopoly. Every drop of water produced in Israel flows through Mekarat's network. They set prices, allocate supply, manage storage, and decide which regions get water first during shortages. That level of centralization makes the system incredibly efficient. There's no duplication, no competing agencies, no regional conflicts over access. But it also creates a single point of failure. If Mekarot's infrastructure goes down, whether from a cyber attack, equipment failure, or sabotage, the consequences would be immediate. Desalination plants are hardened targets, but they're also predictable. Five facilities along a single coastline, all connected to the same national grid. Some security experts have raised concerns about vulnerabilities in SCADA systems, the industrial control software that runs the plants. A sophisticated attack could disable pumps, corrupt treatment protocols, or shut down entire sections of the network. Israel has invested heavily in cybersecurity, but the risk is real. And because the country depends so heavily on desalination, 80% of drinking water comes from the sea, there's very little margin for error. Desalination is power-hungry. Running reverse osmosis pumps 24-7 requires enormous amounts of electricity. Israel generates most of its power from natural gas, much of it extracted from offshore fields in the Mediterranean. Those fields are geographically close to desalination plants, which keeps energy costs manageable. But it also means the entire water system is tied to energy infrastructure. If gas supply is disrupted, whether by geopolitical conflict, equipment failure, or future shifts away from fossil fuels, desal desalination becomes far more expensive, maybe even unsustainable. Israel is investing in solar power to offset this risk, but solar can't yet provide the constant, high-output energy that desalination demands. Engineers are exploring hybrid models, solar during the day, gas at night, battery storage to smooth the gaps, 
but it's a balancing act. Energy security and water security are now inseparable. Comment below if you think this will actually work long term. There's also the environmental cost. Desalination produces brine, hyper-concentrated salt water left over after fresh water is extracted. For every liter of fresh water produced, roughly another liter of brine is created. That brine has to go somewhere. Israel's plants pump it back into the Mediterranean where it disperses into the sea. In theory, the ocean is vast enough to dilute it safely, but some marine biologists have raised concerns. Brine is denser than seawater, so it sinks to the ocean floor where it can affect bottom-dwelling ecosystems. Discharge points create localized zones of elevated salinity, which can stress or kill marine life that isn't adapted to it. Israel monitors discharge zones and designs outflows to maximize dispersion, but the long-term ecological impact is still uncertain. If desalination expands globally, and it's already happening, coastal ecosystems could face cumulative stress from dozens or hundreds of plants all discharging brine into the same waters. Then there's the philosophical question. What happens when you engineer your way out of natural limits? Israel's water system works because it's hyper-controlled, hyper-efficient, hyper and hyper-dependent on technology. I thought of that's powerful, but it also creates fragility. Traditional water systems, rivers, reservoirs, aquifers are resilient because they're simple. If one part fails, others can compensate. But in a system where every drop is accounted for, where water is manufactured rather than collected, there's no slack. There's no buffer. If multiple components fail at once, a cyber attack on desalination, a pipeline rupture, a prolonged heat wave that increases demand, there's very little time to respond. Some experts argue that Israel's success creates a dangerous precedent. It suggests that technology can always overcome scarcity, that engineers can always build their way out of environmental constraints. That's true, until it isn't. Critics point to examples like the Aral Sea, where Soviet engineers diverted rivers to irrigate cotton fields, eventually draining an entire sea. Or California's groundwater depletion, where overpumping for agriculture has caused land to sink. Technology can extend limits, but it can't erase them, and when systems are pushed to their edge, failures tend to be sudden and catastrophic rather than gradual and manageable. But here's the counter-argument. Israel didn't have a choice. Without desalination, recycling, and precision irrigation, the country couldn't support its current population. It couldn't grow food. It couldn't sustain cities. The question wasn't whether to engineer a solution, it was whether to survive. And that same question is spreading. Cape Town almost ran out of water in 2018. Chennai, India hit day zero in 2019. California, Spain, Australia, and parts of the Middle East are all facing long-term droughts. Freshwater scarcity is becoming a global crisis. Israel's model offers a way forward, not because it's perfect, but because it proves that water scarcity doesn't have to be a death sentence. It can be engineered around. The geopolitical implications are just as significant. Water has always been a source of conflict. Rivers cross borders. Aquifers don't respect political lines. Countries that control upstream water sources have leverage over those downstream. But desalination changes that equation. If you can produce fresh water from the ocean, you're no longer dependent on rivers, rainfall, or neighbors. You're hydrologically independent. That shift could reduce water-related conflicts, or it could create new tensions. Countries without coastlines can't desalinate. Landlocked nations, already vulnerable to droughts, would become even more dependent on external water sources. And if desalination becomes a strategic resource, whoever controls the technology, the energy, and the infrastructure gains enormous power, exporting its water expertise. Engineers and companies are working on projects in California, Australia, India, and Saudi Arabia. The technology is being adapted to local conditions. Larger plants, different energy sources, hybrid systems that combine desalination with traditional water storage. Some of these projects are purely commercial. Others are geopolitical. Water diplomacy is becoming a tool of influence. Countries that help build desalination plants gain soft power, trade leverage, and long-term partnerships. Israel's water system, built out of necessity, is now an export industry. But the biggest unknown is climate change. Israel's water system was designed for a specific climate, hot, dry, with predictable seasonal patterns. That climate is shifting. Rainfall is becoming more erratic. Droughts are longer. Heat waves are more intense. The Sea of Galilee, once Israel's primary freshwater source, is now more of a backup. Desalination handles most demand, but if ocean temperatures rise, reverse osmosis efficiency drops. Warmer water requires more energy to process. 
Algae blooms can clog intake pipes. Storm surges can damage coastal infrastructure. Engineers are planning for these risks, but climate change introduces variables that are hard to model. What works today might not work in 2050. There's also the question of what happens when everyone does this. If desalination becomes the global standard, if every coastal city builds plants to secure its water supply, the combined environmental impact could be significant. Brine discharge, energy consumption, coastal disruption, ocean chemistry changes, all of it adds up. Some researchers are exploring ways to make desalination greener, using renewable energy, recovering valuable minerals from brine, even integrating plants with aquaculture to offset ecological damage. But these solutions are still experimental. At industrial scale, desalination remains resource intensive. And then there's the cost. Israel can afford desalination because it has the economy, the infrastructure, and the political will to pay for it. Treated water costs more than rainfall, but, Israel, but Israelis accept that because there's no alternative. In poorer countries, that equation doesn't work. Desalination requires capital investment, skilled engineers, stable energy supplies, and functioning governments. In regions where those things are scarce, water scarcity becomes a humanitarian crisis rather than an engineering challenge. Israel's model works, but it's not universally replicable. Technology alone can't solve poverty, corruption, or weak institutions. So where does this lead? If Israel's water system represents the future, what does that future look like? In the optimistic version, desalination, recycling, and precision irrigation become standard worldwide. Water scarcity. Once a driver of conflict and suffering becomes a manageable engineering problem, coastal cities thrive. Abiyasaku. Agriculture expands into deserts. Populations grow without hitting hydrological limits. Technology keeps pace with the demand. In the pessimistic version, the system breaks down. Wash jets. Energy costs spike. Cyber attacks disable plants. Ecological damage compounds. Climate change accelerates faster than infrastructure can adapt. The illusion of abundance collapses and water scarcity returns, this time with millions more people dependent on systems that no longer work. The truth is probably somewhere in between. Israel's water system proves that scarcity can be engineered around, but it also reveals the risks of hyperdependence on technology. It shows that infrastructure, not geography, determines survival, but only as long as that infrastructure keeps running. The plants have to work, the pipelines have to hold, the energy has to flow, the politics have to stay stable. Remove any one of those variables and the entire system becomes vulnerable. That's the lesson. Water security isn't about finding more water. It's about building systems resilient enough to handle failure, efficient enough to stretch every drop, and adaptable enough to survive a changing world. Israel did that by necessity. Now the rest of the world is learning the same lesson before it runs out of time. If you want more stories about the technologies shaping our future, subscribe to Next Blueprint USA, like the video, and share your thoughts in the comments.